In the back of the room there. Let me move this up just a little bit. Can you hear that any better? Great. Well, welcome to you all. Um, we are very pleased to, to uh, have you all here today and to have uh, this opportunity for Deborah Milkey and her fine lawyers and some of her, her most ardent supporters to uh, share with you some of their observations uh, as they have lived through this experience that you all know about uh, that, that has spanned more than two uh, decades of Deborah Milkey's life. My name is Larry Hammond. I'm with the law firm of Osborne Maladon and am the president of the Arizona Justice Project. I, like a lot of uh, people, have been involved in, in Deborah Milkey's case and working with her lawyers uh, for many, many years. So it's a special honor for me to be able to introduce you to the people who will be speaking today. Let me tell you briefly first how, how we uh, intend to proceed. Uh, we have, have asked Deborah to share uh, her views and her words with you first. Uh, we would... Mike. Oh, Mike is going to speak first. That's what I get for, for forgetting my script. Uh, so, as I said, Mike is going to speak first. Uh, and then Lori, and then Deborah. All right, I knew that was what it was. Uh, so, uh, so w we will proceed in that way, and then I, I have a couple other people who I want to, to introduce you to, um, who we've also asked to, to say, say a few words. And, and once we've had that opportunity, and they've had that opportunity, we will then entertain um, questions. Uh, our time is relatively limited, so we do want to move forward as expeditiously as we, we can, and thank you all for your cooperation. Um, Mike, uh, uh, let me start with, with you. As I think you all know, Mike Kimmerer and, and Lori Vopel have been the lawyers handling this case now for many years. There are other lawyers in the room who have also devoted significant years of their lives to this case, but Michael and, and Lori were the ones who were who were here for the last very d a difficult years of this case. So Michael, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Larry. I don't know if this is on or if you can hear me back there. And, and speak up. Right. It's not on. It's on. Do you hear it? Turn it up. Just move it closer. Move it closer. No, I, is that better? Okay. Okay, great. Let me get it up here closer. Well, first, thank you for all coming. Uh, we scheduled this press conference because we thought it would be good if we could have all of you here at one time, and it gave Deborah a chance to speak and give her thoughts about what has happened to her. I kind of sit here today in really a state of disbelief that we have gotten to this point. This case has been a nightmare for Deborah Milkey for over 25 years. Uh, it started back on December 2nd, still not, okay, December 2nd, 1989, when she was arrested and ultimately falsely convicted for conspiring to have her son killed. And here she was, an innocent woman. She was incarcerated for 24 years, 22 years on death row. And the journey that led us here and why we're sitting here today has not been an easy journey. It's been a long journey. It's had its ups and it's had its downs and it's had its tears and it's had its heartbreaks and it's had its successes. And I have a great deal of gratitude that we're sitting here today 
knowing for Deborah her nightmare is finally over and that she's a free woman and that she can now have a life for the years that she has left to enjoy what, what all the rest of us get to enjoy in the world in which she was deprived of for over 24 years. Uh, when I look at this case, I think many of you know about the myth of Sisyphus, you know, the guy that was the immortal that offended the gods and the gods said he has to roll this big boulder up a mountain all the time and every time it got to the top, the boulder rolled back down again. <laughs> and that's many ways what we experienced throughout this particular case. We were constantly rolling the boulder up the mountain and it would come back down again and we'd walk back down and keep trying to push it up the mountain. Uh, fortunately, this time it stuck. Uh, Lori and I first became involved in this case 15 years ago. And, you know, many times we criminal defense attorneys are always asked the question, how do you defend somebody that's guilty? And the straight answer, and most of you here know that because you've been in this system for a long time, is you know, many of our clients are guilty. We are here because they have rights under our Constitution to have lawyers and they have rights that need to be protected and that's our job and everyone is entitled to that. But I'll tell you, the hardest case that any defense attorney can ever have is when you have an innocent client. And when Lori and I got involved in this case 15 years ago, we took it over after all the state appeals had been lost. Deborah was on death row. The media had characterized her as this demonic woman that had tried to have her own, or who had actually killed her own son and conspired to do it. Uh, so when we got into the case, we were at the bottom of the mountain. And we started looking at the files. Lori dug into the files. And all of a sudden, as we looked at everything, we realized, looking at all the evidence, that this woman is, we have an innocent client. And with all the other things you have going against you, now you have that pressure that this woman is innocent because there was no real evidence against Deborah Milkey except this so-called confession that came from a dirty cop. And we started looking at the history of the case. And there was some great work done by lawyers before we even got here. Uh, you take Ken Ray, her trial counsel. Uh, he did a good job trying to represent her, but he was fighting an uphill battle. The deck was stacked against him. He knew all he had was a he said, she said situation, and he was trying to find evidence to give some balance to it, and he was thwarted and blocked in that effort. And then after the appeal was lost, we had Anders Rosenquist who handled the Rule 32 and really kind of cracked many of the things open because he found a whole bunch of law students who could go out and try to go through files and look through those files and find information about this police officer, Saldati. And they did, they found 20 cases of misconduct. They found cases where there were judicial findings where he had lied, he had violated people's civil rights. He abused the system and, all, and bragged about it, had a reputation for doing it. There were courts in our system that found him to be responsible for basically being a dirty cop that violated people's civil rights. All of that was out there all of that was probably known by the prosecutors, but none of that was ever given to Ken Ray to have so he could impeach Saul Dotti at a trial. And with all of that, to take that and to put it together with everything else and to try to do some of the other things, I want to really point out my co-counsel, Lori Vopel. She has been the laboring oar in this case all the way through. Her heart and soul has been in it from the day we started. She has probably done some of the most brilliant appellate work I have ever seen a lawyer do. And she never gave up. We had setbacks and she fought and we have had tears and we have had heartbreaks. 
but we were always, always came back because of Deborah. And, you know, I look back at kind of a brief history of this, and I'll be as brief as I possibly can, but when we started, we started at the federal system on our, the appeal. Uh, we went to the district court level. Uh, Lori found a way to ask the district court to uh, try to find more evidence about Saul Dotti in his file, and we did. She found and was turned over a report where he had basically uh, engaged as a police officer in trying to let somebody go in exchange for sex. He was reported, he denied it happened, took a lie detector test, failed it, uh, and then admitted that he had done this, and there was a complete record by the chief of the police at the time saying this man's credibility is no good, that he is basically, he was a liar, and you couldn't believe him. And yet this was stuff that was kept from Ken Ray at the trial, and it was in his personnel file, but was never disclosed by the prosecution. That, with all of the other things she put together, we thought we had a good chance at the district court level of, of winning. We didn't. It was denied. So they, we then went to the Ninth Circuit. And we went through a series of different briefings. There were two arguments before the uh, Ninth Circuit. They set the case back. Uh, one time, because there's a procedure where you can have a settlement conference at the Ninth Circuit. And the problem with the settlement conference is they will always want the client to come in and say, well, I've done something, and then we may get let you off for time served or something like that. There was no way that we could even do that or would even try to do that because of our client, Deborah Milkey. Deborah has always said, I am innocent. I absolutely never had anything to do with my son's death, and there is no way under any circumstance whatsoever could I ever come forward and say, that I did something just to get off. I would rather suffer the death penalty before I ever did anything like that. Uh, they even sent the case back to the district court for a hearing. And again, we thought, you know, uh, the hearing went well. We thought we might, we might have had some success. And the, it came back to see if her Miranda rights had been violated. And Saldani was under oath, admitted he broke some civil rights and said, I just leave that up to the courts. Uh, but unfortunately, we were denied. And getting back to my myth of Sisyphus, it's, you can ask the question, you know, why in the world after you get that boulder rolls down the mountain, do you ever walk back up again? Well, it's because you have hope. She was our, Deborah was the one that was always there and I mean, Lori and I would visit her at prison and you know, we would be, you know, after you suffer a defeat like that when we thought we were going to win, uh, we, were, we were down. And who inspired us and who gave us the strength to start pushing that boulder up the mountain again? It was Deborah, because Deborah said, you know, she says, don't worry, I'm innocent, and I'm innocent, and we'll win. And at that time, it just didn't look real good for us, but we kept on fighting. Lori did just some brilliant work in putting things together. We had more briefing, and then finally on March 13th of 2013, the Ninth Circuit ruled, and they ruled, in Deborah's favor. They reversed her conviction and they sent it back for determination to whether there's going to be a retrial at the county attorney's office level or not. And it wasn't just another decision. It was just not a decision to say we reverse this. It was a monumental decision. It was a decision that really for a long time, uh, which needed to be done, addressed prosecutors that hid information. And here they found 
the conduct was egregious, how information was kept back, and that the county attorney's office at that time had to know, had to know that that information was there because some of these cases that Soldati had been involved in, they were cases that courts had ruled on. They were handling them in the same office. And they were findings about his misconduct in his lying in cases in railroading defendants. And yet none of this was ever produced. And it was a blistering opinion by the Ninth Circuit. They said it was egregious conduct. And when it was sent back, we were hoping based on what they showed because they clarified and you have to realize the court spent years going through the evidence, listening to all the arguments. And in that period of time, they found the only evidence here that really connected her to anything in the, the death of her son was this so-called confession that Saldati claimed he had obtained from her in 30 minutes, never making a record of it, never recording it. And yet that was the evidence that she was convicted of when it was presented in court because no one was able to challenge the credibility of Saldati about his history, his past, because it was all covered up. And we didn't have all the computers back then when you could look and find all of this stuff easily. That's why what Anders Rosenquist did was so a monumental task when he found law students that could go out and go through microfiche and files and found all of this misconduct by Saldati. Uh, unfortunately, they decided to retry the case, and we tried to convince the county attorney's office that there was no evidence. If you use the standard of reasonable likelihood of uh, prosecution, of, that they would get a conviction, we felt the chances of that were, were slim. The only evidence, again, was this so-called confession, but they went ahead and uh, made the decision to go ahead and proceed which they did. So we started to get ready to retry the case again. In one of the motions we filed that went to the Court of Appeals was a motion on double jeopardy because the Ninth Circuit had said this conduct of the prosecution was so egregious it went beyond the pale and as a consequence, you know, we use that as an argument. It was their fault that she had that trial so double jeopardy set in. That went up to our Court of Appeals. In our Court of Appeals, in an, another amazing decision, utilizing many of the findings of the Ninth Circuit, but also looking at the whole thing and said, this is egregious conduct. What happened here to Deborah Milkey is an outrage. And what happened here is a stain on our criminal justice system. The state appeal, and they ended up ruling at that point to dismiss her case with prejudice. Uh, the state appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld the Court of Appeals by denying review. And that's why we're here today. After all that process, Deborah Milkey has finally been vindicated. She's an innocent woman who never should have been convicted. She was a victim of a dirty cop she was a victim of prosecutors sitting on evidence that probably would have saved her and saved her from 25, 24 years in prison, 22 of those years being on death row. And I want to talk about really the unsung hero in the case. and that That's our courts. Our courts really came to Deborah's rescue. And I give them a great deal of credit for the courage they showed because we have had Brady violations over the years and we have seen them basically people just getting a slap on the hand and people ignoring them. But in these two opinions, the courts have made a statement. And there are lessons that they have given us out of those opinions. Number one, it's very clear now that if there is favorable evidence that can exculpate or help or mitigate a defendant, the prosecutors not only have a duty to find it, they have a duty to give it and turn it over. And it's their responsibility. 
And if there's egregious misconduct by police or prosecutors, there are going to be harsh consequences. That for years has not been the case. They also pointed out the whole thing about custodial interrogations. That if you're going to have custodial interrogations, verify it. This is just somebody coming in and saying, this is what someone said. You know, Saldati had a chance and was ordered to record the statement that he got from Deborah Milky. He didn't do it. He didn't let his partner in the room. He just walked in there for 30 minutes, came out and said she confessed. And Deborah Milky said, I never confessed. I'm innocent. I never did anything. I think this will, these opinions will help spur a movement in this country where anyone in custody is interrogated. Those, inter uh, those interrogations have to be tape recorded. We have so much technology now, there's no reason that doesn't happen. And I think they're also saying in these opinions that there need to be checks on our systems of justice, or our, syst our police systems and our prosecutorial systems, so they don't become rogue. They don't develop a culture of this type of misconduct, and it just can't ever happen again. And so even though this is a case that's the, I guess it's the end for Deborah, the case is, it's the beginning of her new life. I like to think these cases even mark something that's a bigger beginning, and that is that maybe in our criminal justice system, we have seen a beginning where prosecutors and police are going to have to be responsible for their conduct. All I can say here is a nightmare for Deborah Milkey of 25 years is now over. She is an innocent woman who should never have been convicted, but she's here and free today. And I can't tell you how happy we all are and happy such a flimsy word. I'm just overwhelmed and so overwhelmed I, it's hard to <coughs> describe the emotion I feel that we finally got here. I mean, there were so many moments when Lori and I, we didn't dream we would be sitting here today saying that Deborah Milkey is free. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Lori Bopel has already been identified, and, and Mike said truth when he mm -hmm. talked about her extraordinary work in this case. But I can't help but want to underscore that point. I do not think you will find in the annals of lawyering uh, in this state, and I, and I would say in the country, of, of a lawyer who has exhibited the, the talents of advocacy at a level that Lori Vopel brought to this team and this case. And if there is ever an award given for perseverance in the face uh, of, of adversity, Lori Vopel <laughs> ought to be the one to get it. I'm pleased to introduce her. Thank you, Larry. I really appreciate that and the words of my co-counsel, Mike. <laughs> it has been a long road and, you know, I hopefully can get through this. <laughs> I'm going to tell a little bit more of a personal story about my journey in this case. Um, I was a first-year law student when Deborah Milkey was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. And I'll never forget the images of Deborah, Christopher, Detective Saldate and Deborah's co defendant splattered across every television screen and every newspaper in the state of Arizona. It made a real impression on me, just like it did most other people. And I believed, it's like so many others at the time, that Deborah must have confessed to the horrific crime of dressing her child up in his favorite cowboy boots and sending him out, telling him he was going to see Santa and instead sending him out to be murdered. I never dreamt at that time that just 10 years later that I would begin working so hard for Deborah's freedom and vindication. And over the past 15 years that we've represented Deborah, she has become not just a client, but my friend, my dear friend. 
When I reviewed the enormous file in Deborah's case, I was literally stunned at the lack of evidence linking her to this horrific crime. Thanks to the great work, as Mike explained, of Deborah's trial lawyer, and then by Anders Rosenquist, Terry Capozzi, uh, Kirk Fowler, and the post-conviction team of researchers that they assembled to spend thousands and thousands of hours uncovering cases involving this detective on microfiche in the clerk's office. There was no internet. There were no electronically available records. They did this by camping out at the clerk's office at the Maricopa County Superior Court and just digging through microfiche hour after hour until they could find other cases involving Detective Saldate. It was an enormous feat and one that ultimately really helped turn things around. It took a long time. It should not have taken this long, but it did. And um, because of all of that, we were able to really start seeing what this case is all about. And it was, it was amazing. Um, it, it changed my mind. It changed my outlook on uh, cases and the criminal justice system. And I learned that this case was not about a selfish, self-centered woman who wanted rid of her young child as the state had portrayed. It was about a young 25-year-old mother who did her best to care for and protect her child and who fell into the clutches of a very dishonest, manipulative, and egocentric detective. Deborah did not stand a chance alone in that room without a recorder, without a witness, and without any other form of corroboration with this man. And if any of you saw him testify, you would understand why. Why he won that swearing contest, the hubris, like I have never seen. And there was no, no form of corroboration as to what Deborah said, and more importantly, as to what she did not say. She asked for a lawyer at the outset, right after he read for her rights, he ignored her and then plowed over her in the course of the next 30 minutes. Now, although the great weight, thankfully, of media and public opinion have shifted gradually in Deborah's favor over the years as more and more of the evidence and lack thereof in this case have been revealed, there are a few who say, I still just think in, that Deborah's guilty. That's what my gut says. And all I can say to those few people is that none of you have reviewed the evidence in this case like I have. And none of you have gotten to know Deborah as I have. And so I will tell you that my gut is far more informed than yours. Everyone who has opened their minds and opened their eyes in this case and who have met Deborah, agree that Deborah is not a monster. She is an innocent woman who was wrongfully convicted and who paid a price that none of us can even imagine and should ever have to pay. The loss of her precious child, followed by her arrest and conviction for his death, the loss of half of her precious life and nearly the loss of her very existence. Thankfully, the courts, starting with the Ninth Circuit, finally started to see the grave injustice done in Deborah's case. As well as to Christopher, I add. It has now been two years since the Ninth Circuit issued its scathing opinion after re also reviewing the in-depth, massive file in Deborah's case for a very long time. They had this case for five years. But unfortunately, the decision to retry Deborah ended up costing her, and it cost her more than just another two years. Because her dear mother, Renata, who had been fighting cancer for five years, lost that battle this past August. 
And Deborah lost the ability to spend 17 months and final days with her. Thankfully, Deborah and her mother were able to spend two incredible visits together, to which we were witness. I lived for that day, I'll tell you, for that image. That was my work, was to see that day come. And it did. And she first saw her after Deborah's release in September of 2013, notwithstanding ongoing chemo treatments, she said, wild horses are not gonna stop me from seeing my daughter. And one year ago for Deborah's 50th birthday. And thanks to Judge Maraz's very wise and correct decision to release Deborah on bail, she was able to have those two visits with her mother in person where they could touch and hug each other for the first time in 24 years. Imagine, imagine. And Deborah was able to Skype with her mother nearly every day during her release. I was so thankful for that. And now thanks to our Arizona appellate courts, the attempt to retry Deborah has finally been brought to a halt. To say that we are thrilled and relieved is indeed an understatement. And to stand at the end of this long journey with Deborah, with my co-counsel, Mike Kimmerer, with our amicus counsel, the ACLU, Dan Pakoda, Larry Hammond, Rudy Gerber, the Center on Wrongful Convictions, Steve Drizzen and Laura Nyrider, and the Arizona Attorneys for Criminal Justice, David Eisner and Kathy Brody. This is a privileged, sacred moment that I will never forget. Finally, in addition to absorbing every inch of Deborah's file and learning this case inside and out, and you know, getting to know Deborah over the last 15 years as a client and as a woman on death row, I've also gotten to know Deborah as a fellow mother. The lawyer in me, after reviewing the evidence, knows intellectually that Deborah is an innocent woman. But after getting to know Deborah as a fellow mother, I know in my heart and soul that that is the case. When Deborah was released from prison, her first request of me was whether she could meet my child, who was then four years old, just like Christopher was, when his life was taken away from him and from his mother. When I took Deborah's hands and I told her I would be honored for her to meet my child. And the two of them have developed a wonderful relationship. She doesn't just call her Deborah, she calls her Deborah Milky. <laughs> <laughs> And every time I see Deborah with my daughter, I know in my heart and soul that she is not capable and she has never been capable of the horrific crime that she was accused of committing against her own child. And now I'd like to introduce our client and my very dear friend and fellow mother, Deborah Milkey. one in here. Okay. Right here. Okay. This is in the face. All right. Uh, I just want to start off by saying, can you hear me? I, I had absolutely nothing to do with the brutal murder of my son, Christopher. And I did not give a confession to Mr. Soldate. I always believed this day would come. I just didn't think it would have to take 25 years, three months, and 14 days to rectify such a blatant miscarriage of justice. Losing a child to murder is a devastating tragedy with an indescribable pain that no parent should ever have to feel. It is the purest form of anguish. 
imaginable that sears the soul and the hurt never goes away, ever. The only thing equally worse is to be falsely accused of participating in your own child's death. Someone in this room may identify with the pain of the loss of a child, but I'm quite sure you don't know what it feels like to be accused by the authorities of contributing to it. My little son, Christopher, meant everything to me, and I love him with all my heart. I miss him terribly, and I think of him every single day. He was such a sweet and affectionate child. He loved to be silly and make others laugh. Often, I hear his cute little laugh in my mind that instantly brings a smile to me as I remember the many hugs and kisses. His, I love you, mommy, whispers in my ear. And the darling smile he had that sometimes made it hard for me to say no to him. He had many curiosities, but one of his most favorite things to do was to pedal his big wheel as fast as he could, put on the brakes, and spin out. He went through two big wheels until the motorized little cars caught his attention. And yes, he had one of those, but thankfully he couldn't spin out with it. He'd get the biggest kick out of popping the bubble, I'd blow with bubble gum. The bigger the bubble, the more fun it was for him. Watching it deflate on my face <laughs> caused the giggles, followed by, blow another one, mommy. I have countless memories, precious memories, of Christopher that are etched in my mind, my heart and mind. No one can ever desecrate them, and no one can ever take them away from me. His death is a tragedy of unspeakable magnitude to me, my family, and those who loved him. He is sorely missed but never forgotten, as he will forever remain the greatest joy and blessing in my life. I live with him. I live with an abiding sense of loss, and a chunk of my heart is gone. But Christopher's spirit is with me always, which is a comfort to the remaining pieces of my broken heart. Being falsely accused of a crime you didn't commit is also a devastating tragedy. Try to imagine that as some of you sit in judgment of me. The prosecution against me was one of a malicious nature. My innocence did not matter in their pursuit of a conviction. Honoring Christopher's memory did not matter in their pursuit of justice. We, as U.S. citizens living under the same Constitution, deserve justice. Law enforcement officials are human, and a badge or a law degree does not make them moral. Some of them are corrupt, but many are not. Seeking a conviction at any cost is unconscionable and is not what defines justice. The chief judge of the Ninth Circuit Court perfectly stated that, quote, bad cops and those who tolerate them put all of us in an untenable position, unquote. Injustice does not discriminate. What happened to me can happen to anyone, 
as it has already hundreds of times over thus far across the country. This could happen to any one of you. And if you don't believe it could happen, you're either misinformed or in a deep state of denial. My legal fight pales in comparison to the immense pain in my heart and soul over the cruel death of Christopher. But the unfortunate, unfortunate encounter with Mr. Saldate, who has a long history of lying, fabricating evidence and violating people's rights, left an indelible impression so traumatizing that I can still hear his life-shattering words. In closing, I am profoundly grateful to my awesome lawyers, Michael Kimmerer and Lori Vopel, who lived and breathed my case for over a decade, working tirelessly to redress this injustice. I extend my deepest thanks to the numerous lawyers who helped to restore honor and justice for my son, Chris. I give my heartfelt thanks to Frankie for his years of relentless research and for being the voice for Chris and me. To Pat and Patty, thank you for believing in me and for your unconditional love and support. To my dear mother for sacrificing so very much and walking with me down this pain-filled road. To Paul for being an advocate of mine for many years. And to the thousands of people out there for their belief in me, kind sentiments, and moral sense of justice, my heart is truly filled with enormous gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, before we entertain a a few questions. There are a couple other people I would like to, to introduce you to. Um, we're very pleased to have with us today Professor Laura Nyrider, uh, who has come from Northwestern University School of Law uh, in Chicago today to rejoin us. She has been with us for quite some time and the Center for Wrongful Convictions and the Center for Wrongful Convictions of Youth has been involved in this case for now well over a decade. Some of you may re remember two years ago an op-ed piece that appeared in the Arizona R Republic written by Professor Nye Ryder about one of the critical issues in this case. Uh, the uh, question of the obligation of law enforcement to record interrogations, the very thing th that allowed this farce to continue for decades. Uh, we're very pleased that, that Laura c could join us and w uh, uh, we would like to have you share with us some of your thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, as Larry said, I'm Laura Nyrider. I'm a law professor and a lawyer in Chicago at Northwestern University School of Law at the Center on Wrongful Convictions. Our center has been involved in Deborah's case as amicus curiae, basically friend of the court, an organization with expertise on wrongful convictions. And I first got involved in Deborah's case when I was a law student at Northwestern almost 10 years ago. Her case was my introduction to the criminal justice system. And from that moment on, I knew that I had to study and pursue wrongful convictions because this story was too horrible for words. 
not only have I gone on to study wrongful convictions, but our center has also gone on to found a women's project based on cases just like Deborah's, involving women and mothers who have been accused unjustly of the most horrible crimes. But I'm here today because Deborah's case can teach us all crucial lessons about how to seek justice. Right. Thanks to groups like the Innocence Project and the Arizona Justice Project and our center, wrongful convictions are being uncovered everywhere. If there's one thing we know, it's that no state in the country, no jurisdiction, and no prosecutor's office is immune from the problem of wrongful convictions. But there are some places that are more ripe for wrongful convictions than others. Those are the places where the government has yet to take one of the most basic steps needed to make sure that the guilty go to prison and the innocent stay free. I'm talking about the need to electronically record interrogations. As we've heard, Deborah Milkey's conviction and death sentence were based on nothing but the word of Detective Armando Saldate. Detective Saldate took Deborah into an office by himself. He closed the door and he interrogated her about her son's death. He came out of that room claiming that Deborah had confessed to having her son killed. She came out of that room saying, what are you talking about? I never confessed. That dispute about what happened behind that closed door has lasted 25 years. That's what this case has always been about. But there could have been an easy answer. A simple video recording of Deborah's interrogation from start to finish would have told us what happened behind that closed door. And Detective Saldate knew this. In fact, he was ordered to record his interrogation of Deborah by his supervisor, and he chose to disobey that order. If we could just hit the play button, the courts would be able to decide, would have been able to decide whether Deborah was innocent. The prosecutor would have helped to have confidence that he wasn't prosecuting an innocent woman. And Deborah could have avoided 23 years spent in the hellhole of death row before the court saw fit to end her ordeal. Now, 21 other states, plus DC, already record interrogations. This ranges from New Mexico to Ohio to North Carolina. It is time for Arizona to join their ranks. Although many police agencies in Arizona do record some of their interrogations, they're not required to. It is time to require all police in Arizona to electronically record interrogations from start to finish. It is the only way to prevent another Deborah Milky case. And it is the only way to prevent a second coming of Detective Armando Saldate. Now, as I said, I practice law in Chicago, which is the home of more documented false confessions than any other jurisdiction in the United States. In 2003, after years of opposition from police and prosecutors, the problem of false confessions led our legislature to enact a law requiring police to electronically record all interrogations in homicide cases. Ten years later, police and prosecutors were so pleased with electronic recording because it made their cases stronger. It helped them fight off frivolous claims of abuse. And it built trust between the police and the community that they supported a, an expansion of the law so that all serious felonies would be electronically recorded during interrogation. If we can get those kind of laws passed in Illinois, you can do it here in Arizona. Let me close by saying, you know, if we're really angry that justice took so long in this case, if we really want to take action to make sure that next time justice gets served, I have the perfect solution. Ask your legislature to require police to get out the camera, get out the smartphone, and record those interrogations from start to finish. That way, next time, we will not have to wait 25 years for an answer. Uh, the mantle of responsibility for 
doing the things that, uh, that Laura and all of us have advocated here will fall in large measure to you and it will also fall to organizations like the ACLU and the Arizona Attorneys for Criminal uh, Justice and we have leaders of both of those organizations here with us today and I, I would appreciate it if uh, before we, we go to questioning we, we, we hear from you briefly. This is Kathy Brody, my partner at Osborne Maladon, and more importantly, for today's purpose, the, the uh, president of Arizona Attorneys for Criminal Justice, an organization of defense lawyers in this state that has been in existence since 1983. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And Deborah, uh, Lori, and Mike, thank you for including Arizona Attorneys for Criminal Justice in this very important day. AACJ shares your relief that Deborah Milkey's unjust prosecution has finally come to an end. We also applaud the dedicated work of your legal team and the courageous decision of the Arizona Court of Appeals that found egregious prosecutorial misconduct in this case and disallowed her retrial and the decision last week of the Arizona Supreme Court to let that Court of Appeals decision stand. We are proud that AACJ was able to support you and stand by you as you were forced through this horrible odyssey. And we were thrilled to be able to honor your legal team in January with AACJ's Appellate Achievement Award. As the Arizona State Affiliate of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and the only statewide organization of public and private criminal defense attorneys, Part of AACJ's mission is to assist criminal defendants and their lawyers as they fight for justice in the courts. We did that in Deborah Milkey's case. But it is also part of AACJ's mission to work on improving the criminal justice system as a whole so that the things that went wrong in Deborah Milkey's case will not happen again. I hope that we and all those involved in Deborah Milkey's case can work together and use her case as a lesson and a catalyst for change in two areas. Mandating that police agencies record their interrogations and supporting prosecutors in complying with their obligations to disclose exculpatory information before trial and even after a criminal conviction. All of us who are actors in the criminal justice system, defense lawyers, prosecutors, and police officers should believe in keeping innocent people out of prison, in prosecuting and punishing those who commit crimes, and in doing so fairly and justly and in line with constitutional guarantees and protections. One lesson from this case, as Laura spoke about, is that we should work together on mandating electronic recording of police interrogations statewide in Arizona. That is the direction that law enforcement is going to ensure justice, and Arizona shouldn't wait much longer to join this growing trend. Over 20 states, um, by law or court action, now require electronic recording of interrogations, and I believe the number is more than 1,000 additional police agencies voluntarily record uh, in their interrogations, including a number in Arizona. 
So today, I would invite the prosecutorial and law enforcement agencies in Arizona to join AACJ in asking the Arizona legislature to mandate electronic recording of police interrogations throughout the state. With this one step, we could better preserve important evidence in criminal investigations and at the same time reduce false confessions and wrongful convictions. The second lesson from this case is that we have to give prosecutors the tools and the support they need to comply with their legal and ethical obligations to disclose information favorable to the defense. Prosecutors have constitutional and ethical obligations to give exculpatory information to the defense throughout the life of a case, even after conviction. And this includes information about bad cops. They also have an obligation to look for and learn about bad cop information that's relevant to the case. And apparently not all prosecutors know about this particular obligation. Many prosecutors' offices across the country employ what is called open file discovery, a policy which is endorsed by the American Bar Association that promotes full and open disclosure of information to the defense before trial. I want to ask today, can we start discussions in Arizona about open file policies in prosecutors' offices? Can we work together to make sure prosecutors can easily access information about bad cops and pass that information along to the defense? I hope all of us who work in the criminal justice system can engage in these productive discussions toward what I know is our shared goal of providing justice for all who encounter our courts in Arizona. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kathy. We will entertain a few questions now. Let me say first, though, that that uh, we we are not going to be addressing any questions uh, today that, that deal with with uh, Deborah Milkey's civil suit. As uh, uh, you may know, a civil suit has been filed. Uh, these lawyers are not responsible for that case, and we are not going to to address that, uh, and in particular, Lori Vopel's firm, uh, Jones, Skelton, and Hockley, which has committed so much time and energy uh, t to this case and, and to the work w uh, with Deborah, will not be involved uh, in that case in any in any way. Um, as you're uh, asking questions, I will try to repeat them so that you all will have a good record uh, unless you ask the question in German, and I know that some of you do speak. Uh, there isn't anyone in this room whose German is any worse than mine, so, uh, uh, but, but I may have a difficult time uh, with, with uh, some of the questions, but w with that, w w we'd be happy to entertain a few. Steve? So the uh, question is, uh, if, if Armando Soldate w was here today, what would you say to him? Well, <clears throat> I told you 26 years ago, I had nothing to do with this. I had nothing to do with this. So the a question is, is have, have you come to a conclusion today as to why your son was murdered? I don't know that, that that's a, a question you, you would want to answer, but I'll, I'll leave it to you and, and Mike and Lori. To. Well, <clears throat> I have not come to a conclusion because we don't know what happened because there was not a proper investigation. Nobody, the police, the prosecution, didn't bother to check, to investigate it. So there is, I don't have a, I don't know. Paul, if you believe the right two men are behind bars, this I think 
the follow-up question was, do you believe that the right to men are behind bars? And is that a question you would want to answer today? Okay. Take that question. Never has asked me to address that question because it's it's fairly it's very complicated a lot of things because she has mixed feelings about there but definitely definitely somebody should be on death row of the two men that were there one or both and they should be there and they should be punished for such a horrific crime. And based on what? Well, uh, 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 but, but Deborah, let me uh, uh, okay. see if I can reframe sure. it. The, I, I think the, the general nature of the, uh, of the question is, what do you have to say about what the prosecution thought was evidence that that might corroborate your guilt um, and, and I and again I, I'll leave it to you uh, you're under no obligation mm -hmm. here to, to do anything other than then speak from your heart about things you care about so. I the answer to that and this is in the briefs everywhere Christopher was murdered on a Saturday morning or on Saturday Friday night, the night before, I did laundry. I was only aware of one gun that Jim had or owned. And when I was sorting through all of the laundry, I always dig through the pockets, make sure the pockets are empty. I found a box unopened, they were sealed, of these bullets. And instead of getting up and putting them where they belong, I just shoved them in my purse, which was right next to me on the couch. Put them away later. I continued to sort out laundry. I did the laundry that night. And then the next day, all of this happened. Clearly, I forgot that they were in my purse. That's the answer. There's a lady back here who is waiting. If I could waiting. first, Larry, can I just mention something, yes. too? You know, I always tell people, do you really think that you would bring a purse, knowingly, with bullets that supposedly connect you to the crime to the police station where you don't even know you're going to be arrested in interrogation? You, you would bring that there. I mean, seriously. <laughs> she was doing her laundry, and they were in Jim's jean pocket. Yes, thank you. I'm not sure I heard all of that question, but but I but I think the uh, uh, the yeah. What are your feelings having having? It's not you know, happiness. Been, this is very. This is relief. Yes, but this is bittersweet. There's. It's not happiness. Um. Revenge. I've never had a vengeful heart, and I still don't. So, no. How do you respond to your ex-husband to, to, the state that How do you respond to your ex-husband or to the state that, that claims that, that you still are guilty of murder? 
I really don't want to say, I just don't want to even go there. Um, I, the obvious speaks for itself, so. Yes. I, I don't have any response to him. Yes. Deborah, you gave me an exclusive interview on probably the darkest day of your, your life, at least the way I saw it was the day before you were sentenced to death by Cheryl Hendricks' death in the gas chamber. Uh, during that interview, you talked to me for an hour and a half. You gave me every answer that I asked the question for. It was logical. Uh, you were respectful. It was an interesting interview. Most interesting to tell me part was when you told me that you're going to have appeals and you have faith in the system that this would resolve favorably at some point. Did you hang on to this the entire 25 years? Tell me how this really, your faith in this system, how it maintained and how you maintained your sanity. It wasn't so much faith in the system as a whole. Uh, I just, I, well, back then I was only 25, 26 years old and naive about all of this stuff, but uh, I, I just figured, well, somebody will see all this and it'll be corrected. They'll see that this is all wrong and it'll be corrected. Um, and then as the years went on, I learned how politicized the system is. And then I came to the realization that not all judges, not all, not everybody has a political motive. And so I just held out hope that I, some judge would, would see it, it, you know, and they wouldn't, um, what am I trying to say? They're, uh, they would do the right thing. That's an, an excellent question. It's one of the questions that Lori and I and Deborah, we have been asking that question throughout the 15 years. What really happened out there on that day? Who was really responsible? Why would this happen? Why would they want to kill this boy? There's all kinds, of, and you and I have discussed it, there are all kinds of different theories and concepts. Some people think that it was Styers that did it and that he did it because he wanted to get rid of Christopher because he had a romantic interest in Deborah, even though we know that was never reciprocated, they had no romantic interest, but that he wanted one. We now know that Styers had a really very bad background in the sense of uh, post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome out of Vietnam, he was disabled, he had been involved in killing children in villages and things of that nature. That all came out in his appeals process. Did something happen out there? Uh, one of the things Deborah never wanted Christopher to be around is guns. That was a real big issue. Mm -hmm. That's how come she, when she saw the bullets, she had to get rid of them and made sure that Christopher wasn't around that and it chastised Styers for that. Mm -hmm. She was getting ready to move out, had found her own apartment and was ready to go with Christopher and live. Was that something that maybe precipitated something in Styers? She's going to leave here and be gone, and therefore, you know, if Christopher's gone, maybe she'll stay. Maybe that's some kind of irrational thinking. Or was it Scott? Scott is also basically a mental cripple in many, many ways. Uh, he probably only friend he had was Styers. Deborah did not want Scott around. She told Styers that she did not want Scott there. As a matter of fact, on the day that they took Christopher, or Styers did, when he said he was going to take him to the store. 
he then went and met Scott so Scott could go along and why that happened, you know, what was that all about? Uh, and what if Scott, was he so upset of the relationship that Styers had with Christopher and with Deborah that he felt that if he needed to get rid of the child? You know, I've gone back and forth all over the questions. A lot of people say it was Styers and I kind of lean more that it might have been Scott was the one that did it. Just know it was a brutal, horrible killing of a four-year-old boy. I really don't, and I wish I did. No, but you know, but you see the different facts, the ones I'm talking about, and the different people. You know, something along those lines is what triggered it. I've also thought it could have been an accident. They tried to cover it up, and then by covering it up, it ended up putting them in a situation where it was homicide. But three bullet holes in the back of the head doesn't make it an accident. It was deliberately done. What did I say? What I you are one of the most despicable characters that I have ever met. You have not only destroyed a life, you've destroyed many lives, and what's worse is you've tarnished a system. You have made it look like we have an unjust system, and I'm proud of our system of justice when it works right. When there are people like you in it with that kind of power and it's abused, it's despicable. That's what I'd say. I, I, I actually think we're, we're, we're just about out of time. We have time for probably one or two more questions here. Let me just ask somebody who hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet. Where do you see the, the next steps being? Where, where, where do you want to go from here? Actually, like I said earlier, there's, I don't feel happiness. I just, it's a relief, yes. The, the victory is bittersweet. I, my son's gone, my mother's gone, and so I just asked the question, now what? So I really don't know. I don't know. All I can do is take one day at a time. Uh, uh, Mike and uh, uh, Lori and Deborah, do you have any closing uh, thoughts you want to share b before we bring this to an end? I, I would like to say something. Okay, I, please. The, the lawyers were talking about the seriousness of recording and, you know, and, and getting a bill. It, I didn't have a criminal record at all. I'd never been in trouble with the police, ever. I didn't break the law. I never thought in a million years I would see the inside of a jail. But I did. It, it happened to me, and it really, it can happen to any one of you. It really can. So these people with power, they shouldn't be allowed to abuse it. Maybe someday we'll be able to do more. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming. All right, everyone, that is a wrap on that uh, 
Fairly lengthy press conference. We were watching for an hour and 15 minutes as Deborah Milkey and her lawyers spoke to the media for the first time really publicly addressing the media since uh, Deborah Milkey got off death row, had her uh, conviction overturned. Uh, if we get any more information or updates, we will bring that to you live here on News Now. As I promised earlier, we will be bringing you uh, that conversation, that uh, press conference between the President of the United States, Barack Obama, and the President of Afghanistan. That event was going on simultaneously as this Deborah Milky event was going on, so we made sure to roll on it, record it, so we could play it back for you guys in just a second. I see some video. Uh, I'm going to go back to the Milky event because I still see some video rolling. Not sure what's going on here, but uh, let's uh, just continue to watch and see if anything happens. Test. 